at this weekend, we enter into, as a family, Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of trumpets, the new year, and then after that, the holy days are here upon us. Mm -hmm. And although we're not physically, most of us, not physically Jewish, we are spiritually Jewish. Yes. And so we can honor the Lord, we can remember what He's speaking to us. And I want to encourage you to be especially aware of what's going to be taking place in Washington, D.C. at the return. Yes. It's going to be in prayer. It's going to be things. Just go online and look at the return. And uh, you know, just Jonathan Conley is one of the sponsors of this, and God is really moving in this. So I want you to be a part of that and be aware of that, okay? Today I want to talk to you about the sons of God. Kings and priests, the sons of God. Before I go into my message, I want to give you a slight introduction, and it's this. There's two kinds of sons of God. The first sons of God, the creation of that race, what we call the angels, that angelic race that was created, took place millennium ago. We have no idea how far ago it was. It could have been 5 million, 10 million, 20 million. We have no idea. We do know this. There are hundreds of thousands and tens of thousands, ten times ten thousands angels. Now, God did not say, poof, let there be angels, and there was millions of angels. They're a race, just like we're a human race. They are the angelic race. And they lived, they were created. There was a first one and a, and a, and a male and a female, and they created a race. And they have lived for millions of years, probably. They are basically not like us. They're made of different stuff. Paul tells us in the Bible, they have celestial bodies. In other words, they have a, a body that's different than ours. We have earthly bodies. They have celestial bodies. But the celestial bodies are in many ways like our earthly bodies. I've told you before, God appeared to Abraham when he was sitting in his tent, and, uh, at the front of his tent, under the flap, and two angels were with him. And when Abraham saw them, he told Sarah, prepare a meal. So they went and got a lamb, and they got it, and they prepared it, and then they cooked it, and they got the bread, and they got the milk, and they got the other things, and they laid it out, and God and two angels ate a meal with Abraham. Mm -hmm. So they angels can eat. When, when, the, when they were in the wilderness and there was the manna on the floor of the desert every morning, God said to them, this is angel's food. He wasn't joking. There's a spirituality to that. So God created these and they were called the sons of God. Now, God is bringing out a second race that he wants to make into sons of God. We're all the children of God. Saved or unsaved, we are called in the Bible the children of God because he gave life to Adam and Eve and they brought forth the human race. Amen. So everybody is a child of God. We are children of God as Christians in a better way, in a, in a more perfect way. We've been born again. We're not just children of God in the natural, we're children of God spiritually. But we don't want to remain children of God all our lives. We want to grow and mature. We want to become sons and daughters. We want to manifest the qualities of Jesus. Amen? Amen? So there's two kinds of sons of God. Angelic sons of God and human sons of God. Amen? Amen? So with that as an introduction, let me talk to you a little bit about something that we have in the Word of God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. If you have your Bible here, if you got it on your phone, or you got it on your iPad, or you got it on your tablet, wherever you got your Bible, hopefully if you have a Bible Bible in your hands... If you haven't got a Bible Bible, you can go in the back row and there are Bible Bibles there. So if you don't have a physical Bible, go in the back and get one. Open up. If you don't have a Bible at home, get a Bible. Amen. We need the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Talking about everything that happened in the Old Testament. We're going to go all the way from Malachi back to Genesis. Everything that happened, Paul says this. Now all these things happened to them. To who? To those who were alive then. It happened to them as examples, and they were written for us, for our ad admonition or instruction, upon whom the ends of the age have come. So Paul is saying, all these things that have happened in these ages, the age of the Father, the age of the Son, we're now in the age of the Holy Spirit, they were all written down for us to learn from. And that word examples, when he says, now all these things happen to them as examples, in Greek that word is types. And so we have something we call in the Bible types, examples of things. 
When we talk about a type, and if you want to take notes on this, it would be good to take notes on. I know you take notes. <laughs> when we talk about a type, what we see is a biblical person, a place, an event, even an institution, having a future historical fulfillment. Something happened in the past, but that's just an example of what God's going to do in the future. And it's happening in our lives. It's been happening for 2,000 years to the church. Examples have come to life now in the church. And so in the Greek New Testament, the word type or typos means example. And it's for our instruction. Now, listen to this. Romans chapter 5, verse 14. If you haven't turned to that, Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Death reigned from Adam to Moses over them, even over them that had not sinned after the same type of sin as, as Adam. In other words, Adam sinned a certain kind of sin, but death reigned over all sinners, even if they didn't do the same thing Adam did. Adam committed high treason against God. We, don't, we didn't commit high treason, but we're still sinners, and death reigned over all mankind. And he said, this, even if they did not sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure, that's the word type in Greek, it's a figure or an example, a type of him who was to come. Adam is a type of Jesus. Adam is a historical person, but he foreshadows Jesus coming. When Adam is talked about in Matthew, in the genealogy, he is called Adam, son of God. Okay? Because God gave him life. And Jesus is the one that we're looking to to bring us into a new life. Adam and Eve brought life in the world. God is using Jesus and the church to bring life in the world also. Amen. And when we talk about shadows, you know, we talk about types and shadows. In the Bible, we have to remember what a shadow is. What is a shadow? If there was a spotlight on me right now, there'd be a shadow behind me. You know, it would have a little bit of my shape. It wouldn't look like exactly like me, but you'd be able to tell that this was a shadow of a man. If it was a woman with a skirt on or something, you'd see a different shape, and you'd say, that's the shadow of a woman. This is the shadow of a man. So it's not exactly it, but it's like it, and you can recognize things about it. A shadow is cast when light strikes an object. An object standing in light will cast a shadow, right? The shadow resembles the object, but not perfectly. So even though the finer details are missing, you can still recognize what it is. If there's a tree and the sun is shining and you see the shadow of the tree on the ground, you don't say, oh, it's a squirrel. It's not an elephant. It doesn't look like a whale. What does it look like? A tree. A tree. Mm -hmm. You can recognize it. Amen? Okay. So the shadow is usually similar enough that you can figure out what it is that's standing in the light. What the real thing is. The shadow's not the real thing, but it represents the real thing. So we can see both of these words, types and shadows, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. This is my introduction to you about sons of God. Okay, we have to, we have to understand everything in the Bible is for our example. The end of the age has come upon us. This is the end of the age. Things are going to shift. We're going from the church age to the kingdom age very soon. So we have to understand it says, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, the author is speaking about Jesus and the priests of the Old Testament. He says this, these things serve as an example and a shadow, a type and a shadow of heavenly things. So when we look at on the earth, you see the tabernacle. He, God is saying, actually, that's a shadow of what's in heaven. It's just a shadow. It's not the real thing. Everything that they did in there was not what God really was looking for. It was only an example. It's just a shadow. The real thing was in heaven. Okay? And he says, they serve as a type and a shadow of heavenly things. And as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to build the tabernacle, God said to him, look, make everything according to the type I showed you on the mountain. In other words... When Moses was on the mountain with God, 
God took him into the heavens and showed him the heavenly tabernacle. And said, I want you to build this on earth as a shadow, as an example of what this is here. Okay? So types and shadows. So the tabernacle itself. The sacrifices. God is not concerned about the blood of bulls and goats. Or the dove. Or a heifer. He's not concerned about these. These are only shadows of the real thing. Okay? He says that the sacrifices of the priests were a type and a shadow. The high priest is a type of who do you think? Jesus, our high priest. Right? And the tabernacle was a shadow of the cross. If you look at the, at the tabernacle on the inside, you see the entrance. Then you see the labor. Then you go into the holy place. And you see the table of showbread. And you see the candlestick. And then you see the altar of incense. And then you see the holy of holies. It's the example of the cross. Of Jesus on the cross is what the tabernacle is. His feet were burning it like a fiery, a fiery brass. That's the altar of sacrifice where they would have the fire. And then the washing of the water of the word came out of his heart. When his heart was pierced, it said blood and water came out. And we are washed clean by the word of God. We're forgiven through the blood of Jesus. So these things are sacrificial. They are, they are types and shadows. So we don't need to totally understand every detail of all the things that happened in the Old Testament. But we've got to find out what do they mean for us. Okay? Look at 1 Corinthians 10 again. These things are examples or types of, of things written for us upon whom the end of the age has come. We are at, as I said, the end of the age. We have to understand we're at the end of a certain period of time. I've said this how many times? I don't know. From Adam to Abraham is just about 2,000 years. The day with the Lord is as 1,000 years. It's two days. From Abraham to Isaac is a few years, 14 years or so before Isaac becomes the sacrifice. And so from Isaac to Jesus, who became the real sacrifice, you see, Isaac was a type of Jesus. Isaac was being offered by his father as a sacrifice. And then God said, no, don't do it. The Lord himself shall provide a sacrifice. Mm. In other words, but really what it says, you know, that's what it says, Jehovah Jireh. But when God said Jehovah Jireh, what do we think Jehovah Jireh means? The Lord will provide, right? But that's not the whole definition. The whole definition is the Lord will provide himself as a sacrifice. That's what Jehovah Jireh means. The Lord will provide himself as a sacrifice. So Isaac is the type. Jesus is the fulfillment. Isaac's father was going to offer him. God the Father did offer Jesus. So we see these things. And then he says this. Paul is telling us we're at the end of the ages. These things are happening for us. We have to look at and find out what is happening now. Now that we're at the end of the age. Adam to Abraham 2,000 years. Isaac to Jesus on the cross 2,000 years. That's four days. How many days did God work in creation? Six. So we have four out of six. So what does that leave us? Two. From the Holy Spirit falling to Jesus returning 2,000 years. Where are we now? We're just about 2,000 years from Jesus' death on the cross and the Holy Spirit falling. If we understand when Jesus was born, it was on Renee's birthday. We have figured this out with Jonathan Kahn and looking at Jewish records of the priests and when they were there and this and that. And we, have the, we, have, we actually have the exact day that Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was in the temple when the angel appeared to him. The exact day is there because the reading is there, the scriptures are there, the history is there. It was in 7 BC. Jesus died in 33 AD. But really, he was born in seven... The calendar's all mixed up. So we're at the end of the age, 2,000 years. So two for the Father, two for the Son, two for the Holy Spirit, and then we have one for the kingdom, the millennial reign. Okay? And that is coming next. So we're about to shift. From the shift of Adam to Abraham, it's a shifting from in about 14 years for Isaac to be born and to be growing up. And then from the shifting of Jesus' death on the cross to the Holy Spirit falling is only 52 days, 53 days. When Jesus resurrected, 
to the time that Jesus ascended was 40 days, and then 10 days later the Holy Spirit fell, so the church age began 50 days after the resurrection. We went from a 14-year cusp or shift to a 50-day shift. We may even have a shorter shift coming up from the church age to the kingdom age. I don't know. But we'll find out when it happens because it's in our day. We're alive now. This generation, these young people that are here right now, and those at home and those that are growing in the Lord, yes, if this, if this is going to be happening in the next seven to ten years, that something amazing is going to take place, they're going to be the teenagers. They're going to be the young adults. We need to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. Amen. We need to indoctrinate our children in the doctrines of Christ. And we need to just not give them the teachings of Christ. We need to give them the example of Christ of our own lives. Yes. That we're not, our life is not caught up in money. Our life is not caught up in boats or cars or planes. Our life is not caught up in things. Our life is in Christ. Yes. And our life is an offering yes. unto God. We are crucified with Christ Amen. as a sacrifice. The Bible tells us we make up what was left behind of the sufferings of Jesus. In other words, Jesus suffered, but he left behind certain things that had to take place, and that's us. We have to go through certain suffering so that his plan can fully be implemented. Amen. And the end of the age is upon us. It's getting close to the end. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, 5 and 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Everybody who knows when I preach, I give you lots of what? Scripture. Okay? So you can test it out, you can search it out, you can see if it's true. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, and his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. So the quickening came when we were saved. And quickening means to be made alive, spiritually. We were dead in sin, Satan reigned over us, death reigned over us, but when we're born again, we break out of the death that reigned over us, and Jesus reigns over us, hallelujah. Amen. And we're alive to God now. How many of you are sinners, saved by grace? Amen. Well, I, I have to give you an update. You were a sinner, saved by grace. Now, you're a saint. Paul never writes to, to the church and says, to the sinners in Ephesus. No, the to the sinners in Philippi. Who does he write to? The to the saints. Yes. To those separated from the world unto God. Yes. You're a saint, not an ain't. Yes. Hallelujah. So, we've been saved by our faith in Jesus. Our spirit is alive right now. And this is a, a part of the positional truth that we live in. Right now, eternally, forever, we're alive in Christ. But there are experiential truths we must go through. The Bible tells us that the Old Testament people went through things that were types and shadows for us to go through now at the end of the age. And the last part he says here in verse 6, he has raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so that raising up and sitting with him in heavenly places has yet to come fully. It has come a little bit here and there. Our salvation is real right now, and we are raised up with Christ through, actually through water baptism, which some today will be raised up with Christ through water baptism. They're buried with Christ in baptism, they're raised up with him when they're raised out of the water, and now they need to live a life for God, okay? But sitting with him in heavenly places is only experiential truth for us. How many of you have actually gone to heaven and sat down with God in heaven? How many of you have ever been so filled with the Spirit that you knew you were being lifted up? Amen. You were being raised up. Amen. But we don't stay there. We always come back down here. No matter how great the worship is, no matter how much our prayer time is, no matter how much we feel the presence of God, we come back down. Because we're not yet sitting permanently in the heavenly places. But God has a plan for some to sit in heavenly places. Okay? Now, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Paul talks about himself here. He doesn't like to boast or brag, so he doesn't want to write a book about, I died and went to heaven. Yeah. He just says in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in his body or out of his body, I don't know, only God knows. Most scholars believe Paul is talking about himself, because this happened 14 years ago, which is when it happened to him in the Arabian desert. Paul didn't stay there. It was temporary. He sat with God in the heavens, but he didn't stay there. It was temporary. It was experiential, but there's more to experience. Without a doubt, some of us have gone there. 
There was a day in Piper, some of you were there. And I was being prayed over by a sister, her name was Beatrice, an apostle of God, mighty miracle ministry. And while we were praying, I just fell. <laughs> and my spirit went out of my body. Yeah. And it went straight up into the sky. Yeah. Some things happened, and I ended up, my feet landed in heaven. I know I was in heaven. There were two angels on each side of me, and I just fell back down again, and then I was on the ground. Yeah, I didn't stay for a long time, probably one tenth of a second. Yeah. Yeah. But I was there. I know. And when I got up, I told what happened. And then I'll tell you about what she said later on. And then she said something that I really didn't understand how she could say that. So I wrote to Brother Taylor. I said, I said, Dad, I said, something just happened. I didn't tell him what she said. I said, what do you get out of this? He said the same thing she said. I got a confirmation of what God was doing in my life at that time. So it was important, but it wasn't forever. I'm not still up there in heaven. I don't walk around heavenly places. I can go up in the spirit sometimes and feel like I'm right there with God just like you can. But there's going to be a time when God wants to bring us up to sit with him in heavenly places and not to have to come back down again. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, and again, we see this again, over and over again. Leaving behind the principles, the, the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, we want to go onwards to perfection or maturity. And this we will do if God permit. We're at the end of the age. God's going to permit it. Some of us are going to go on into perfection, into a maturity that's beyond anything we've ever felt, felt before. It's impossible, he says, for those who were once enlightened, verse 4, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. The heavenly gift is eternal salvation. And the Holy Spirit is the baptism of the Spirit. He says it's impossible if you have received that enlightenment. And you have tasted of the heavenly gift. And become a, a partaker of the Holy Spirit. And you have tasted of the good word of God. And the powers of the age to come. If you fall away into apostasy. You, you, it's impossible to come back. So he's not talking about us. He's talking about some. Like Judas. It was impossible to come back. The Bible says he went to his place. He didn't go to God's place. He went to his place. Because he had tasted of the age to come. He had felt the power of the Spirit. He had done these. And there's others in, in, in the past who have done these things. They have gone through in, in, the, in the age of the church. There are those who have actually apostatized. And they have fallen away. And it's impossible for them to come back. But we're not going to focus on that. I want to focus on one thing here. The powers of the age to come. Wait. Paul says we're living on the edge of a change. We're about to enter into the last age. We're at the end of this age. And if we've tasted of the powers of the age to come. So in other words, some are going to be tasting now of what's going to take place later. Okay? Some are going to taste now what's going to come, play, come to take place later. The powers of the age to come. He's talking about dunamis. He's talking about a word that means mighty miracles. And he's saying there are mighty miracles that are going to come. Now, we've all seen miracles take place. We've seen things. But we haven't seen a continual flow of miracles like Jesus did. But the Bible says that the same works I do, you shall do. In the early church, they did it. In the early church, a sweet sister died. She was loved by everybody. They went crying to Peter and said, Peter, she died. Tabitha died. And he said, bring me to the house. He went to the house and he went inside everybody to get out. He talked to the Lord. He said, Tabitha, get up. And she got up from the dead. Yeah. Mighty miracles took place. We don't see that happening all the time. They walked in that. They saw that. Eyes, eyes were open. Blind eyes were open. We've seen pieces of it. Some have tasted of the powers to come. We've had great miracle ministries like A.A. A. Allen, Brother Schambach. I've seen many, many mighty miracles in this ministry. Our own church has had some mighty miracles take place. But we're not walking in it all the time. We're tasting of it. Remember Joshua and Caleb and the 12 spies? Where did they go when Moses sent them into Canaan? They went to the promised land. And what did they taste there? They tasted the milk and the honey and the fruits of the land. But they didn't stay there. They didn't live there all the time. They went in and experienced and tasted it. Then they brought it back. Just like some of us have gone into the age to come. The age of miracles to come. And we tasted it and we brought some back. But we're not there all the time. But God is getting us ready. The church is getting ready to enter into the age to come. Some are tasting the powers of the age to come now. We're going to see an increase 
Over the next 5, 7, 10 years, we're going to see an increase as we decrease, as we allow ourselves to die to ourselves and to forget about our own agenda. As pastors, I'm talking to pastors right now, as you let go of your ministry and your goals and your dreams and you seek God, you will see God move. Amen. Hold on to your dreams, you will miss it. Giovanna came back from Italy in 2001, in October. After 9-11, after she was there for a month. Stuck, couldn't leave. When she came back, she said, I have a word for the ministers. Let go of your agendas. Let go of your plans. Drop it all and just find Jesus in this. Amen. Seek the Lord and he'll show you a new agenda. Amen. Amen. So God is moving, amen, by his spirit. Now, Joshua and Caleb went in. We know that. So they were what we would call a forerunner. What are they a type of? What are they the example of? They're the example of us. We're entering into heavenly places. We're tasting of these special things. We take... Joey, you tasted of it two weeks ago. <laughs> you walked in crippled up, sprained yep. ankle really bad, expecting to go to an uh, emergency center, and you walked out praising God, walking and leaping and praising God, tasting of the age to come. Amen. Nikki, you tasted of the age to come. Two months ago, you couldn't even sit down on the couch for an hour. Two months ago, you couldn't clean your house. Yes, last week, you're riding a bicycle. You're walking for two miles. You've tasted of the age to come, the powers of the age to come. So we have tasted of it, but God wants to bring us into it. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. And he wants to bring us to the place where we're in his presence more and more. And how do we get in his presence? When we worship in spirit and in truth. You can do this at home. You can do this in your car. But as Shant was saying, folks, you need to do it together. In the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, some are preparing the way, like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a forerunner who prepared the way for Jesus to come. God, I believe that God has put me in a position of being a forerunner, preparing the way for Jesus to come again. When John preached, what did he preach? You can have your best day ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can have everything you want. Oh my God. Oh my God. Everything is beautiful. Don't worry about anything. Just keep on confessing it. Just keep on saying it's going to happen. Just keep believing. Just keep believing. Just keep believing. Say it's going to happen. That's not what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist said, repent. You better repent. repent. What makes you think you're going to get in? You think you're going to get in because you're Jewish? Jesus said, God can take stones and raise them up and make them Jewish people. You're not going to get in because of who you are. You're going to get in because of who he is. And the only way you get in because of who he is when you die and he lives in you. So the message of John the Baptist is not about not a message of everything is fine and dandy. We're going to have everything we want. Life is going to be candy. No. The message is you need to search your heart, search your soul, and find out like Peter said. My God, listen to this. Peter's right into the church and he says, you need to search yourself. And make sure you're still saved. Make sure you're still saved. Ananias and Sapphira missed it. They wanted money more than God. And what happened? Peter said, when Ananias lied to him, he said, you didn't lie to me. You lied to the Holy Ghost. And the man... Drop down dead. Then his wife comes home. Hi, oh, Ananias. Oh, Ananias not here right now. Oh, well, where's he? Well, you'll find out in a minute. He said, how much did you sell that house for? Did you keep all that money? Did you have to? You? Oh, no. We... She told the same lies he lied. And Peter said, the men that just took your husband to bury him are at the door and will bury you too. This is the message that God is bringing today. The church can't play church no more. Come on. Come on. Life and death are here. Forget about this. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Yes, I know it. I believe it. But you can't just speak things and make everything beautiful and perfect like that. Well, I'm going to have a new car. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. That is not God's will for our lives. God's will for our lives is that we have nothing yes. but Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus brings things to us as we enjoy and appreciate them. Amen. Things are different than what we've been hearing. Amen. I, 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 I keep digressing. Sorry. Okay. Now. There are some sons of God sitting in the heavenly places right now. They've been there for millennia. They're the angelic sons of God. And God chose among all those angels a group. And he calls them his 
counsel. He calls them his divine counsel. The counsel of the holy ones. The counsel of his heavenly saints. If that is in the old area of life, God wants to do something new. He wants us to learn something from this. They're sitting in the heavenlies. They're not sitting in the heavenlies in Christ. They're sitting in the heavenlies because God raised them up to sit them there. And he has done things with them. We need to look at them and find out who they are. This heavenly council, this divine council, we find it in the book of Job. I'm going to give you a few scriptures real quick. Job chapter 1 verse 6. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came among them. So Satan was one of the sons of God. And he presented himself just like the others came and presented themselves. Why did they present themselves? God called a council meeting. So the sons of God came and presented themselves. Okay? Second scripture, Psalm 82, verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. That word gods is Elohim. It's God with a small g. He, what it means is that they're made in his image after his likeness. And they've been given the power to do things. He placed them in this place, this position of authority. It's his counsel. He chose them. You think they're all great, right? They're all wonderful. They're all good. <laughs> Didn't Jesus choose a council of twelve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet one of them was a devil? Yeah. I'll let that sit. Psalm 89, verse 7. He is a God, capital G, greatly to be feared in the council of the Holy Ones. Awesome above all who surround him. Daniel chapter 7, this is an, a, a different example of this holy council, this divine council. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. As I look, thrones were placed. So these on the divine council, they're sitting on thrones. I think Paul mentions thrones in the Bible yeah. when he says, nothing is going to separate us from the love of God. Not this, that, not thrones. He's talking about them. All right? He said, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. And his clothing was white as snow. The hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. His wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued out and came out from before him. And thousands and thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the court sat in judgment. Now, that means that millions of angels stood before him. But some of them sat with him. Okay? The court sat in judgment and the books were open. It's plain to see what Daniel said. There may be millions of angels, but there's only a group that are in his divine counsel. It's like it is going to be in heaven. There's going to be millions of people saving and living and serving God, standing before the throne, but there's only going to be a group that are going to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Yes. Yes. You see how they both fit the same pattern? It's an example for us to understand. Now, those who sit on the thrones have judgment. A throne is for judgment. You do business on a throne. I can't get into all the details of what's going on in this area here. But, Daniel gives this group a name. He calls them the Watchers. They're watching. Chapter 4. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 13. Just a few minutes here. Daniel says this in chapter 4, verse 13. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in my bed. Behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said this. Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Now he's not talking about a tree. That's just a shadow of a man standing in light being judged. It says, chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it, and the birds leave its branches. But leave a stump from its roots in the ground. Bind it with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the animals 
that eat the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's into a beast. So you see, the tree being chopped down is not a tree, it's a man. And the cutting off of the branches and the leaves being shaken and all those things happening, that's not leaves and branches being cut off, that's his mind being turned from being a man's mind to being the mind of a beast. And he says this, let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the watchers. The decision by the word of the holy ones. For the purpose that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdoms of men. And will give them to whom he will. And he even sets over them the lowest of men. Now look what happened and how this was actually carried out. Go to chapter 4, stay in chapter 4, go to verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, now 12 months after a whole year, but it came to pass, though the vision tarry, it shall come. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Now the palace of Babylon, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon, the walls of Babylon, these, this, this was one of the ancient wonders of the world. And he's walking on the roof of his royal palace, and he says this, Is this not great Babylon that I have built? I think I hear it this way today. Is this not a great ministry that I have built? Touching the world? Everyone comes to me for prayer and to understand the things of God. I hear it differently. But, I, but that's a shadow of stuff for today. Hopefully God will have mercy on ministers today like he had mercy on Nebuchadnezzar. It only lasted for seven years. Then it came back. He says this, It's not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty. And while the words were still in his mouth, a voice fell out of heaven. This was like a thunderclap. Boom! Came down. And the voice says, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. I hear it today. Yeah. Depart from me. I never knew you. You shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules and gives the kingdoms to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against King Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men. Why was he driven out? Because the spirit that took over his mind drove him out. People didn't drive him out. His insanity drove him out. He was driven from among men. He ate grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. His hair grew as long as eagle's feathers. And his nails became like bird's claws. Just as the watchers had decreed a year earlier. The sentence fell on Nebuchadnezzar. So... You can understand that this divine council, these watchers, they have authority, they have power. So you would think, well, they're all great, they're all good, they all serve God. But even as I said, Jesus said, have I not chosen you and one of you is a devil? That doesn't mean that they all stayed faithful to God. They didn't stay all faithful to God. The scripture shows us that they did not stay all faithful to God. Psalm 82, verse 1 through 8 is the whole psalm. I'm going to skim through this. It says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. I read that to you already. How long, and he says this, to the, now he says this to his divine counsel. How long will you judge unjustly? How long will you show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth have been shaken. I have said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any ruler. And then the, the Spirit of God says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. 
you shall inherit the nations. There's a time, we see this in the Bible, the Tower of Babel was built. Those in the Tower of Babel building it, they wanted to build it up into the heavens so that it would reach into the heavens. Why? So they could have fellowship with the fallen ones, the fallen angels, have power, have authority. And God destroyed their plans and confounded the languages of men and they were divided up and they went into different places and the Bible shows us they went and, and there were 70 nations came out from the Tower of Babel. They were all one nation and now 70 nations came out. And the Bible tells us that he gave those nations to the sons of God to rule over them. Remember Daniel? He's told by Gabriel. Gabriel says, I had to fight the prince of Persia. I had to fight the ruler of Persia. And when I go back, I got to fight the prince of Greece, the ruler of Greece. Remember I told you about Archie? It doesn't mean prince like the son of a king. It means a ruler, a king among kings. Mm -hmm. So there are these things, these fallen ones, they're not all good. They're fallen. All the angels of God aren't good, but they're all immortal. They don't die. Listen to this. Why did God take Adam and Eve out of the garden? He tells us plainly. Take them out. Put them away. Guard the garden. Lest they put their hands to the tree of life. Eat and live forever. The angels were created with bodies that live forever. Man was created with a human body that if it was sustained properly, it could live forever. So God took away that from Adam and Eve so they wouldn't live forever in sinfulness. But that they would die in hope. And God says to these fallen ones, these members of his divine... Now, not every member of the divine council is bad. They're not all evil. They haven't all fallen, but some have. We don't know who's what, who's who. That doesn't matter. But he says to those who have fallen, he says, you are going to die like a man dies. You're not going to be immortal forever. What does he say to Satan and his followers? You shall be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever. Your immortality will be a death. Amen? Hallelujah. So God is saying that there is something that is in all these things that pertains to us. He had sons of God. He gave them rulership. What does Jesus say about the sons of God in the book of Revelation? He who overcomes will sit with me on a throne. You will rule. He says those of you who overcome, you will rule the nations. I will say to this one, you've been faithful over this, rule over this nation. You rule over that city. He's going to raise up sons of God who are going to take the place of fallen angels. That's why they hate you. They don't know which of you is going to take their place. Could be you. Could be you. Could be a little girl over there. They hate us all. They want to destroy us all. They are here to kill, steal, and destroy. Because they don't want to lose their place. If they could kill us all, they could stay where they are. But they can't kill us all. We're already dead. We're dead in Christ. And we're alive in God now. And he's changing our lives. He's bringing us into his purpose. You would ask, I'm sure, why would God allow these fallen angels to continue to rule the nations? Who do you think is ruling over Iran today? You know what Iran is, right? The country Iran? It's Persia. The prince of Persia still rules over Persia. And God's good angels still have to battle that angel. Who rules over Russia? It's not Michael and Archangel. It's somebody else. And he ain't a good guy. These nations are being ruled by fallen angels. And so we need to understand out of all those things, the Bible says this in Psalm 82. He says, Arise, O God, for you shall inherit the nations. God says to Jesus, he says, I will give you the nations for your inheritance. In other words, I'm going to take away all these nations from these fallen angels and give them to you. Jesus. And Jesus says, and if you're faithful, I'll give it to you. Because as my father did, I will do. You're called for greatness, church. You're called for greatness. Now look. You might say, I'll never be able to rule a nation. I don't have that ministry or that life that God's going to say, you're going to rule a nation. Hey, how about you rule a block? How about a block? 
How about an apartment house? How about you become the light of the world in the apartment house that you're in? In the spirit realm, you'll be ruling it. It'll be you who starts to do things. One, one, one girl said one time, one time to, to Jesus, says, don't you and Frank believe in demons? Don't you know that there are demons around? She said, yeah, we know that. She goes, how come no demons manifest in the church? How come there's no vomiting demons and people screaming and yelling and going crazy? And I told her, we don't let them in. We have authority. This is our house. He has no authority here. They'll try to get in. Sometimes some will sneak in. No wonder. Back in the Presbyterian parish house, one of them ran up and, and started screaming, I'm the son of God, I'm Jesus. Oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. the ushers didn't let him in. I remember that. Yeah. Brought him back to the back and threw him out. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. A prophet came in here one time from France. He stands up after we're worshiping and praising. Thus saith the Lord, this church is this, this minister is that, blah, 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 blah. Everybody should leave this and that. I said, excuse me. I said, God, how do I answer that? God said, tell him this. I said, excuse me. I said, do you believe the word of God? Yes, I believe the word of God. This guy's a false prophet. Do you believe the word of God? Yes, I believe the word of God. I said, well, the word of God says, if you go to a place and you're not received, go outside and shake the dust off your feet and go away. Right? He said, yes. I said, I don't receive you. Go outside, shake the dust off your feet, and go away. <laughs> because we have authority. We can rule. You can rule in your house. You can rule in your apartment. You can rule on your block. You can have a safety zone. You can have a prosperity zone. You can have God's blessing in your neighborhood. Amen. Don't think about nations all the time. Think about reality. Wouldn't it be great to have an apartment building where people just keep getting saved in different places? How do they get saved? Because you're living for God. And they see that you do good deeds. And they see that you're nice. And they see you're kind. And they see you don't react. And when somebody does something nasty to you, you bless them anyway. And you pray for them. And they see that and they say, wait, wait, this must be a real Christian. Yes. How do you become a real Christian? And then you say, give your heart to Jesus. Mm -hmm. You let go of your own desires and will and you recognize you're a sinner. Mm -hmm. And give your heart to Jesus and you can be born again. And the same spirit that lives in me will live in you. Mm -hmm. I want that. Mm -hmm. Now, you're becoming a son or a daughter of God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? It's happening. It happens in your family. We saw it go through my family like wildfire. I got saved. My mother and father got saved. My sister got saved. My other sister got saved. My brother got saved. My kid brothers got saved. My uncle got saved. My aunt got saved. My cousin got saved. My other cousin got saved. We ended up, we had a family picnic. About 110 people, about 90 were saved. It didn't happen by accident. It happened by rulership. By authority. It happened by love. The best rulership is love. Love one another. Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. That nasty person at work who always has a problem with you, always calls you names, always laughs at you, always does those things, do good to them. Mm -hmm. I know what you're not going to like doing it. All right, I'll do good to them. I'll do some real good to them. <laughs> say, hey, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus says, I forgive you, now do good to them. And so you go and you offer them something. You bring a peace offering. You do something else. You're kind. You're kind. You help out in some way. You see, you don't follow the pattern of the world. Right. You follow the pattern or the type or the example of Jesus. Amen. And you go from being a child of God to becoming a son or a daughter of God. Amen. And you manifest the love of God. The manifestation of the sons of God is going to be the greatest manifestation of love the world has ever seen. And out of that love, miracles are going to begin to flow. And when that happens, the world is going to see a witness like it has never seen before. And when that happens, we'll talk about that next week. Mm -hmm. Right now, let's stand together and pray. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Those of you at home, you can stand. If you're driving your car, don't drive and stand. <laughs> a friend of mine, Jose, if you know Jose, he was telling me about his buddy, who was really spiritual. He said, oh, man, he's really spiritual. I said, is he? Wow, that's exciting. I'd like to meet him. He says, oh yeah, we were driving to church one day, we were praising God so much, he took his hands off the steering wheel, closed his eyes, lifted his hands, and just praised God. I said, he's not spiritual, he's stupid. <laughs> he said, what? I said, that's stupid. That makes no sense. If you feel it that much, pull over to the side of the road and praise God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, don't get messed up with this super spirituality.
Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We ask your blessing upon the word. Lord, I pray that we'll begin to see examples in the Old Testament and how you want to bring them into our life. That we'll see shadows of things in the Old Testament and you'll want to bring them into our life that we'll have understanding. Most of all, Lord, I pray that we'll have the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. That we'll die to ourselves. That we'll continue to say, not my will, but thine be done. That we'll continue to go through the trials we go through, the testings we go through. And we will go through worshiping and praising you, Father. Worshiping and giving thanks to you, Lord Jesus. Going through this by the power of you, O Holy Spirit. We thank you. And Lord, we pray today, in Jesus' name. For our lives to be totally turned around, that we might begin to walk into perfection, maturity, that we may begin to manifest the qualities of the Son of God and become true sons of God. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you today. You. Father, I want to thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, and I ask you to bring more of your healing power into our church family. Yes. Lord, touch our bodies that we may serve you. Grant us faith, Lord God, to walk, even in pain, to walk and to praise you and glorify you. And use these things, Lord, to touch the lives of others. Amen? Amen. 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 I don't know who that's for, but that's for somebody here today. Maybe a few people right now. Amen? God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. Go forth and be a son.